Hello, it's been a while since we've met here in the San Antonio Express News studio for a Nosotros podcast, but we're back, and first up is U.S. Representative Joaquin Castro, who in February of this year had surgery to remove cancerous tumors from his gastrointestinal tract. The story of how the tumors were discovered is an international one, one that you'll want to hear from the man himself. Castro, the twin brother of Julian Castro and son of District 7 City Councilwoman Rosie Castro, talked about other topics from ethics issues facing the U.S. Supreme Court to the Spanish boar that sort of saved him. Congressman, thank you for joining us. It's so lovely to see you, period. And um, to see how you're doing, tell us how you're doing now. Thank you. I'm, I'm doing a lot better this week, actually, than the first month. Uh, this is one of the first times, besides going to the grocery store, this is one of the first times I get out of the house. So thank you, Elaine, for getting me H-E-B out H-E-B first. Yeah. <laughs> That's about Which it. Which one so is far. your H-E-B? Uh, usually I go to the one on Babcock and um, Hebner. Okay, because they all have a different vibe. Yeah, that's true. As Carrie Clack has schooled us on, on Facebook. Um, okay, tell take us through this chapter in your life, how you uh, first found out that there was something wrong. Where were you and what happened? I was in a car accident. If I hadn't been in a car accident, I would have never found out. I mean, eventually I would have, but not for a while. Um, I was in Spain because I was the honorary co-chair of the U.S. Spain Council. And I'd been doing it for four years, and this was the last year that I was going to do it. And we had our conference in Bilbao, Spain. And it was the last night before I was supposed to fly back home to San Antonio. I had a 7 a.m. flight. And this dinner, they, we'd gone to this dinner that was about 30, 40 minutes outside of Bilbao on a highway. And we drove out there in the day. And I didn't notice. Uh, but on the way back, it was very dark. And uh, so this dinner, we had this dinner and, and we came back. And I was a passenger in a car. And there was a Spanish driver. And we had a few other folks with us from the conference. And... Uh, you know, we come up, and he's probably going about 65 or 70 miles an hour, I think. And I look right in front of me and see this boar or javelina or something immediately in front of me. I had not seen it before. He obviously had not seen it, the driver. And we just hit it straight on. Boom. Was How and, big was it? Uh, I actually have a picture. Yeah, so we're lucky that it didn't come up after it hit the hood come up into the windshield and go through the windshield or crack the, something that would have done more harm. But, you know, it messed up the front part of the car. And, you know, the ambulance came and the police came and all that. And I was actually okay. I was feeling okay, except that my hand was starting to swell up. And I was worried that maybe I'd broken a bone or something. And so I said, well, I'm in another country, you know, for insurance purposes. They were asking if I wanted to go to the hospital. I said, well, I should probably go just in case I got to document this. And I thought they were going to take a look at my hand, you know, and say either something's wrong or nothing's wrong with your hand and then you can go catch my flight and come back home. But we got there to this hospital, which to me seemed to be in the middle of nowhere. Um, and they start treating me like a full-blown trauma patient. They put the headgear on me, they want to do an MRI with contrast. I'd never had an MRI with contrast where they inject the dye into you. Mm -hmm. So they do all that. It takes a little while. They pick me up. They put me under the MRI machine. They do the MRI. And the doctor, they're about to let me go. She says, oh, we think everything looked okay. And, you know, we're going to send you down so we can get you checked out. And then she comes back about five minutes later and says, my radiologist called and he thinks that he sees these neuroendocrine tumors that have gone from your small intestine up into your liver. And I didn't, I couldn't even pronounce at that point, I couldn't even pronounce th that kind of tumor, right? I was, I, I was struggling to get the word pronounce right. Pronounce it again. It's neuroendocrine tumor. And, and it took me a, you know, a few more days to finally figure out <laughs> exactly how to pronounce it. Um, and so they said, when you get home, 
yeah, you need to go see the doctor. And so July and August for me was full of doctor's appointments first in San Antonio and then that moment in Houston. When he's she's telling you this. You know, we all are faced sometimes with the C word and um, either ourselves or our loved ones, and there's um, an internal panic attack. Is that? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, they're basically telling you they think you have cancer in that moment. Um, There's absolutely a panic. Yeah. Um, And you're struggling to figure out, you know, whether it's absolutely true, whether there's a chance that they're seeing something that's not really there. Um, you know, growing up uh, in South Texas as um, a Latino, I grew up on the west side of town, and diabetes is rampant in San Antonio and in South Texas. My grandmother had diabetes. My mom has diabetes. And so that's kind of the illness that you're trying to avoid, right? Like that's the thing that you're watching for, I think, or a lot of, a lot of Hispanics growing up around here. And so cancer was not really on my radar, just for me. I mean, I understand, that obviously, there's a community that's affected by it and so forth. But for me personally, in terms of what was on my radar, that was not really on my radar. Although, you know, it should have been because the only grandparent I ever knew was my grandmother on my mom's side. And we grew up with her until we went away for school and so forth. She lived in the house with us. But she's the only grandparent that I knew. But my mom's dad, who she was estranged from, uh, died of cancer. I don't know what kind. I don't think she knows what kind. But he died of cancer. Mm -hmm. But since I didn't know him, I think maybe I'd met him once, it was not something that was ever on my mind. because I just didn't know him. Um, So it was always diabetes. And so all of a sudden, I'm faced with this other illness. Your um, family, your beautiful family, um, did you at that point already have the baby? I can't recall now. Yeah. My, in fact, I found out on July 2nd, which was two months after my, my daughter was born. So we have a nine-year-old daughter, a seven-year-old son. And a two month at that point a two month old daughter now an eleven month old daughter. Congratulations! Thank She's you. gorgeous. She's they're all gorgeous. Um, okay, so you're faced with this. You end up at MD Anderson. Um, I'm assuming the greatest of care. And um, take us through that and um, sort of uh, describe your headspace as well as how it was affecting your family. Uh, I mean, it was really hard on my wife. Uh, I mean, it was hard on me, but it's hard on my wife. I think hard on my family to just come to terms with it and what it could mean. How old are you now? Uh, 48. Yeah. I was 47 at the time, but 48 now. Yeah, so it affects everybody. I mean, it affects obviously the patient, um, but also your family as well. And I had appointments here in San Antonio. I did end up at MD Anderson in Houston. And um, they do all these scans on you and tests, PET scan, MRI, CAT scan, all sorts of stuff. And uh, they confirmed that I had uh, neuroendocrine tumors in my small intestine that had come up to my liver. And I have one on my chest, I think, around my lung. Um, but you know, it's kind of a, (laughs) kind of a case of, of good news, bad news. You know, the bad news is that it's, it had spread, um, you know, it had moved from my small intestine to my liver and so forth. Uh, The good news is that these things, at least the kind that I have, it's a grade one tumor are, they were still small, which thank God it was caught when it was. So it was still small, and, and it was grade one, so it's slow growing, uh, which obviously gives you more time to mm-hmm, deal with it mm-hmm. and to treat it. Um, and they monitored it for a few months, and then in December, you know, they're kind of asking you what symptoms you're having, because these kinds of tumors can cause certain symptoms. Uh, it can mess with your blood sugar levels, um, you know, make you go to the restroom all the time, all sorts of stuff. 
And, you know, after... Were you experiencing, did you feel different? Or did you not notice any health issue at all? Yeah, well, it's interesting, you know, because um, the doctor after the surgery, after they'd gone in there and taken the stuff out and all that, said he thinks that I probably had him for about five to 10 years. The, the people can walk around, often walk around with these tumors for six, seven years and don't realize it until something like this, where either they grow so big that you go to the emergency room or you're in an accident or some other reason why you get an MRI with contrast and they figure it out. Um, but looking back, I think it was causing symptoms. I just didn't attribute it to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by December, they said, oh, we think you should have this surgery to get the ones in the small intestine removed. They didn't want to remove the ones in my liver because it's on both sides of my liver. They're small, but it's present on both sides of my liver. So, you know, the liver can regrow itself. Mm -hmm. Ordinarily, if it was on one side, they would take it out um, and your liver would grow back, the part that was removed. Isn't that odd? I, I know. It, it is amazing. So it's reptilian. Um, but because it's on both sides and it's still very small, they didn't want to take a chance. Uh, so that's where I am. I <clears throat> had the surgery. Uh, they took a bunch of stuff out. Tell us. Line it all <laughs> Jeez, up. Line just, it all you up. Know? Uh, yeah, so they took out like a third of my colon. That's what one of the doctors told me. I'm going to go with a what third. what is that in, um, in inches? Or? You know, to be honest, Elaine, I didn't even ask. <laughs> yeah, that they took out any colon. It's like, So a know, third of it. A third. I'll That's get what back the with you with me. an estimation. Yeah, a third. And then they only took a small part of my small intestine. In fact, they said um, had a lot of small intestine. They were able to only take out a very little bit. And, and then about 44 lymph nodes because 20 of them were cancerous. Uh, and then they took out my gallbladder and my appendix. And you don't need those. Yeah, they're not, they're not essential. No. But there's a lot of things missing in there. So once they sewed you back up, you were missing a whole lot of things. Yeah, I mean, it takes, that's what, that's the recovery is getting right. your body to, to function as close to normal again uh, in this new kind of arrangement. And so, <laughs> arrangement. And so I've already asked the pertinent question about has he eaten enchiladas yet? And the answer is no. I have not, no. <laughs> One of the good things about, you know, I probably needed to lose a few pounds, which I have now because of the <laughs> surgery. Um, but um, no, I'm trying to eat a lot better. I was, you know, over the years, I don't drink very much. I used to not drink at all. But I don't drink very much. I know I've never smoked, That's uh, even good. though you know my mom was a longtime smoker. My dad used to smoke a pipe or cigar or whatever. But I've never done those things. The one thing that I've been addicted to is uh, caffeine, mm -hmm. is Diet Coke and mm -hmm. iced tea and everything. And I think I've, I've maybe tried Diet Coke once in the last six weeks. So I'm trying yeah. to like trying to yeah. finally quit it. I don't know. We'll see. Quit caffeine. Well, the one great thing about this story is we can thank a boar or javelina or whatever. <laughs> it's true. Well, the next big story that's also family related is um, your mom and this historic event on city council. Uh, more than 50 years after she ran for an at-large position on the city council, a system of elections that she helped evolve and yeah. to into district wide um, campaigns and elections, uh, making us all the better represented. So this was um, a really special moment in history. And I'd love for you to reflect on that. Oh, I was so happy for her. Um, it is kind of like a fairy tale ending for her in, in a way. Yeah, she was such the outsider when she ran in 1971. In, there was still no single member district, so there was no district one, district two, you know, based on geography. It was all a place system at large. And she had made a comment back then. You know, she lost, I think she came in second out of several candidates. And the guy that beat her, I think, was Charles Becker, who became mayor a few years later. And you know, she said, I'll be back or we'll be back. And she came back mm -hmm. and she got sworn in. My regret is that I missed all of it because I was, you know, I was dealing with all of this. Uh, so I need to, I, I need to go out and 
to City Hall and see her office and visit her before her term is up here. Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations. That was a beautiful moment. Um, the other Castro story before we get on to issues is your brother on MSMAC. I mean, I'm sure oh, that's yeah. been uh, pretty uh, <laughs> neat to watch. Yeah, no, it's been good. And I think he's enjoying it. You know, they have him, well, they have him doing like analysis on different shows and stuff, but uh, he enjoys the guest hosting. Uh, He's been filling in for Alicia Menendez sometimes. So Mm -hmm. I know he's having a lot of fun with it. That's wonderful. Okay. Um, So much has happened in the interim of your hospital stay and your recovery. And among those stories that come to mind are Trump's legal um, issues, um, uh, Clarence uh, Thomas, um, and um, the recent discovery by ProPublica of um, of taking just these luxury vacations and the ethics concerns there. And the continued issue of, of gun violence and gun accessibility. And so take any one of those topics that you might like to um, discuss. Oh, I mean, the gun violence is just madness. Um, you know, I look sometimes and it's reported on the number of incidents. But then to see them in the news unfold, sometimes live, right? Like sometimes the cameras are there and you're watching what's going on. And just the human toll. And then as a Congress or as a state legislatures for governmental bodies to not do anything and for an entire political party to get in the way of any kind of reform, the Republican Party getting in the way of any kind of reform, just as a person, you know, put aside that I'm obviously in public service, but just as a person with young kids, I have two elementary school kids, nine and seven, uh, to watch that in action is frightening. I mean, it's scary. The idea that people would see these kids die uh, and others, adults get killed and so forth and still not be moved to consider change. Um, And I think it makes the average person wonder what it's going to take to actually inspire people, elected officials, to do something. Because we're just going to keep seeing, I mean, we're going to keep seeing these mass shootings. We always hear that the gun lobby is so um, active in Washington. Um, Have you seen that? Um, with your own eyes and what does it look like? Yeah, I mean, you know, they obviously I don't I don't have a, a relationship with the NRA <laughs> or the gun lobby. They don't and so come forth. visit you and offer money. No, years ago, I think they had called to try to set up a meeting, but I don't think I ever met with them. And this is maybe when I had just come into Congress and they're trying to feel out like where people are going to be on these issues. Um, no, I mean it's um, that's certainly part of it. But, but really, it, it, I know that we often talk about the, the strong gun lobby and so forth, but it's not just that they have a pack. It's not just that they're spending money and so forth. All of that has to be backed up by voters in districts who are going to get behind the NRA positions. So I think you can't, you know, you can't let those voters off the hook who are mm-hmm. actually backing up the NRA. Mm-hmm. Um, which is kind of it's kind of strange, Elaine, because then you look at the numbers that say 88 percent of Americans support background checks, right? Right. So you know, overwhelming support right, yeah, for I mean, lots at, of gun at eighty eight percent. You know, you're not going to get there with just liberal Democrats, right? Eighty eight percent of anything in this country, and so a bipartisan level of support. You know, I wonder sometimes, well, where? I mean, who are these conservative Republicans? Who are they catering to? Like, where is the crowd that's demanding that you not do background checks? I mean, yes, the gun lobby and so forth. Um, but you would think at some point, so somebody, there's a few, I mean, literally just a few uh, that are willing to buck that. But you would think at some point you would have more of them in mass that would say, hey, you know, this resistance is illusory. You know, it's grass tops. It's not really the people in my district who are against something like background checks. You know, now if you said, hey, ban the AR-15, you probably get a bigger group of people in their districts who are against that. Um, but yeah, so, it, you know, it's, it's a gun lobby. But, it, it, you know, at times it's also people who are against those things, against that change. 
Can you comment on the Clarence Thomas ethics issue and ethics um, in general in Washington? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I've been a proponent since my days in the state legislature for strong ethics rules. And I was actually, I was not really up to speed on the ethics rules for the Supreme Court. And there don't seem to be much of any. Or if there are, they're not being followed very well. And I was surprised that, especially because the Supreme Court is the court that stands in final judgment of the interpretation of laws, right? And that means, the you know, it's affecting all segments of society. They're basically standing as a final arbiter of what is right and what is wrong in terms of legal interpretation. And so you would think that that body would have some of the strongest ethics rules and enforce those ethics rules on their members, the justices. So I was, I was somewhat shocked to see that somebody could take that many free trips, that much travel from this billionaire in Texas and Dallas and not even report it. I mean, not even, I mean, not even be transparent about it. It'd be one thing if you put it down and let everybody see what you're doing, but not even report it. To me, that, that's shocking. Um, Donald Trump is going to face several legal hurdles um, uh, by the end of this year. And the first one, um, many interpret as a weak case, um, the case of paying off um, a porn star. Um, what's your take on the on the other cases that are coming up, one in Georgia and one in D.C.? I mean, ultimately, I think, well, we'll see if the other ones are brought. I think they should be. Uh, but ultimately, that's a decision for grand juries and prosecutors in those places. I do think that there are things that Donald Trump has done during his lifetime and even during and after his presidency that if an average person here in San Antonio did those same things, you would be prosecuted. Uh, you would be arrested. You would be charged. You would be prosecuted. And so, you know, I support making sure that no one, including Donald Trump, is above the law. And people have talked about how this is unprecedented and uh, you may go down a slippery slope to to where everybody's prosecuting ex-presidents and so forth. I really don't believe that's true. I mean, we've gone all this time up to now as a nation with um, very intense, very passionate, um, heated politics at times, and it hasn't happened. And the difference is that you had a president who flouted the law in a way that other presidents had not. He behaved in ways that other presidents had not. Uh, I'm not saying every president has been perfect and an angel and there weren't some close calls that folks would take a look at, you know, I'm sure. But to do these things repeatedly over and over again, um, yeah, I think that's unprecedented. And I think there's a greater danger for not prosecuting that behavior. And that, that greater danger is that if a future president sees that you didn't do anything to hold Donald Trump accountable last time, then he or she can get away with whatever they want, mm-hmm. and then they're going to abuse the office. To me, that's a greater danger than you know uh, some slippery slope that you may go down on prosecuting ex-presidents. You're headed back to Washington on Monday. Yeah, I go back. Uh, we the Congress, the House at least, has been out of session since the end of March, and so we start back up on April seventeenth. So I head back to DC. And um, tell us what's top of mind um, as you head back. What uh, pieces of legislation you want to make sure um, get um, an airing, or that you that you're pushing for. Well, you know, I'm always, my number one job is to watch out for San Antonio. I have the main San Antonio district. So all of the basics of education, jobs, healthcare, particularly as we're looking at the budget coming up uh, over the next few months and making sure that we continue to make progress on these things and not fall back. Uh, But also, you know, a few years ago, the Congress reinstituted uh, what were known as earmarks and now called community projects. They got discontinued years ago because, quite honestly, they were abused. Uh, But now the the process has been tightened up. Uh, 
uh, to try to prevent that abuse. And so I've got about 15 different uh, community projects that I'm trying to get funded for San Antonio. This is the third year now. So we've done, I think, 25 in the years, last two years. And how, how big a pot are we talking about? Uh, millions. Uh, you know, I think last time our number was 15 million. Hopefully it'll be bigger this time. Uh, now it's interesting. The last few years, the Democrats were in control of the House of Representatives. We were able to do things in education, health and human services, and so forth. Uh, when Republicans took control of the House of Representatives this past January, uh, they decided that we're still going to do earmarks, but now most of it is for things like construction, uh, things like that. So, you know, because of that, I can't do, I can't help fund a lot of the projects that I'd like to do. Uh, you know, we worked with St. Mary's University and got them in the last two years, I think over $6 million for a lot of their uh, academic work that they're doing. Um, got money for to combat homelessness, for affordable housing. And we still were able to, you know, request a little bit of that this time, but not nearly as much as I'd have liked. So trying to get that done. Uh, and then, as you can imagine, all of the big, there's so many big issues right now, uh, access to abortion, uh, to make sure that, you know, women can decide the fate of their own bodies. Um, and the health of their families. The that's right. People that are yeah. already here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the immigration issue is still raging as it has for years now. Uh, so that continues to be a very important issue for South Texas. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, the gun violence issue, obviously. Uh, so I'm going back and jumping right in the middle of it again. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, several of our newsroom editors um, said Godspeed, and, and that's thank what you. we wish you as well as you as you continue to recover. Thanks for no, coming in. Thank you. And I want to say thank you to everybody also who wished me well when I was in the hospital and during recovery. We got so many nice emails and notes and everything. Uh, so I appreciate it. Thanks to the boar. Yeah. <laughs>